So hi everybody. Uh, I think OBG was uh, quite uh, easy. It wasn't uh, something again um, I and I level at all. It was more of a neat PG sort of exam. Um, I didn't find any tricky question, but let's go through the questions. The first question was early onset preeclampsia is defined as, and we've discussed this in our classes, that we def we divide preeclampsia in two ways. We divide them either as severe and non severe and the other way we divide them is early onset and late onset and um, uh, early onset is defined as preeclampsia before 34 weeks okay and the way to prevent early onset preeclampsia is by giving ecosprint that's another commonly asked question so the answer here is before 34 weeks of pregnancy now we go to the next question the next question was also quite easy uh, this is what is restitution and uh, when uh, again in mechanism of labor we all know the steps starting from engagement uh, 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 then descent flexion internal rotation then the head is borne by extension then restitution so restitution is nothing but untwisting of the twisted neck so when internal rotation takes place by one eighth of a circle when the head is free from the confines of the pelvis of the bony cage it simply untwists by 45 degree and that movement is called as restitution. So again, simple, straightforward question. If you know a little bit of your basics also, you'll be able to answer this. Now, this question, I got a lot of queries. And I don't, when I take my classes, I don't tell incidences or percentages too much. But this is one percentage I always tell. Because it's it, it usually comes. And somehow, since, since we've been students, our, our professors always teach this. And I also keep teaching this to my students. I don't know why, but it is important. So very few instances are important. And I just, I just talk about three, four important percentages in my class. This is one of them. So female infertility accounts for 40%. Male infertility for 30%. Okay, and the remaining 30%, this is 70. The remaining 30% is 15% is unexplained. Okay, and 15% is combined, both male and female. So this is 15% is the cause of unexplained infertility. So if you see any of my lectures, be it main videos, be it mission, be it marathon, somehow I always tell this and probably this is the reason why. Okay, which step is not included in active management of third stage of labor? So, um, uh, I'm not sure about the last option. Okay, but this is very, uh, this is quite clear. I've always told you again, AMTSL, the basic AMTSL by government. Just give me a second. Okay, so after delivery of shoulders, even if it was mentioned, I'd still stick with bimanual compression as the better answer because that's for management of atonic PPH. Okay, not for, not part of prevention. Next question is something which is asked in every exam repeatedly. This itself is telling you that this is imperforate hymen. Okay, so bluish bulge, they present commonly with cyclical abdominal pain, urinary retention, bulge in the abdomen. Okay, and then you get confused between these two. But remember a TVS, if it's especially a low TVS, will not have the bulge because it's thick. Okay, whereas a hymen is very thin. So the blood bulges out and you see the typical bluish bulge. Okay, what was the fourth option? This is, can anyone tell me the fourth option? So I just complete the question. Okay, uh, let me know the fourth option. I'll check. I'm repeatedly getting stuck. Just a second. Next question. A 24-year-old presented with secondary amenorrhea with primary infertility with value of LH 0.3 FSH2 prolactin 20 TSH 1.2 BMI 17.5. So again, I've told you in the classes that they may give you the value. So you should know what is normal, what is abnormal. I have told you anything more than 10 is high for FSH and LH and anything less than 1 is low for LH and FSH. Okay. So this is hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. This is hypo. So here you have LH 0.3. FSH is 2. It's, it's, it's a little in the normal range, but it's still low on the lower side. LH is definitely low. So this is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Like you see, a common example would be Sheehan syndrome. So you have where FSH, LH also are low. She has secondary amenorrhea with primary infertility. So this is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. So this is Ovira syndrome. I'll just add it here. Okay. Next question. The shortest anterior posterior diameter of the pelvic inlet. So what's the shortest anterior posterior diameter? 
so um, um or the or i think this was the shortest diameter or the ap diameter i'm not too sure but if you have you have three ap diameters you have the diagonal conjugate which we actually measure okay this is the sacral promontory this is the pubic symphysis in front then you have the obstetric conjugate true or the anatomical conjugate so the the, the shortest conjugate is the obstetric conjugate that is the one through which the baby actually has to pass through okay so this is what is the correct answer again diameters they won't ask you the exact values but if you understand the concept you'll be able to answer this better next question so there was a clinical scenario of an ectopic pregnancy choose the incorrect statement there was something given about shock in a patient okay and they were asked they were asked uh, uh, what is the incorrect statement so there was an option of oral methotrexate, which is never given. I'm not sure about the other options. Pain is definitely the most common symptom out of the triad of symptoms. Okay. But what were the other two options? If you could just let me know in the chat, uh, in the comments, I can see and then see. Okay. So here there was a fourth was true conjugate. So true and anatomical are the same. So there are two other options, but there was one incorrect option and we don't use oral methotrexate. I think the, the, there was a more specific answer that it is given in cases of uh, when you can't give methotrexate in intramuscular, you give oral uh, if, for uh, if a patient has kidney failure, something like that was given. Okay, PID and sexual related. Okay, I thought that was a different question. So I think it was the same question then. Yeah, methotrexate in renal disease was mentioned. But anyway, we don't give oral for management of ectopic pregnancy. We always give intramuscular. Okay, then there was a question on cancers and uh, tumor markers match the following. I think it's been discussed in pathology. So we won't discuss this here. This was also a very straightforward question if it was from the gynae tumor section. Then there was a question on histopathology of what I have uh, gathered from most students is that it was shown over secretory endometrium. And it was asked the hormone responsible for this is secreted by. So secretory endometrium, if the picture was of, it is secreted by progesterone. It is, it is caused by progesterone in the luteal phase of the cycle. And luteal phase of the cycle, that means this, the hormone is secreted by the corpus. Sodium. So, copper sodium secretes progesterone and that creates the secretory endometrium. Okay. All right. I'll come to that question on the large cyst. Okay. Next question, which is not an indication for an instrumental vaginal delivery or uh, specifically a forceps was asked. Again, not very sure which it was. Uh, but it's very obvious for CPD, you will not apply any instrument. CPD becomes a direct indication for a cesarean section, whereas in fetal distress, maternal exhaustion and prolonged second stage. And the fourth indication to do an instrumental delivery is if you want to cut short the second stage, then you would do an instrumental vaginal delivery. So CPD is the correct answer. Okay, so it was it was four steps. All right. Okay. Okay, a patient came with vaginal discharge with odor and the WIF test was positive. We all know WIF test is for bacterial vaginosis. The question could not have got simpler than this. Okay, and I've always told you from vaginal discharge, you are definitely going to get a question both in the INI and in the NEAT-PG exam. Okay, next question. When is delayed cord clamping done? So remember, delayed cord clamping is the norm. It is done in all babies, term and preterm, especially preterm because preterm, the instance of anemia is higher. Any baby not requiring resuscitation, you are going to do a delayed cord clamping. All the rest options were there to confuse you. This statement has been taken up directly from the WHO um, guidebook, so guidelines. So vigorous term and preterm babies not requiring resuscitation. Any baby, whether it requires resuscitation, you will do a immediate cord clamping. Again, AMTSL is a very, very commonly asked question. So I've told you this, PPH is a very common area where they ask questions from. Next question. Okay, so this was a bit of a confusion because um, students have told me that the, 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 so it's very it's a very easy question. It's, it's a repeat question. Quadruple test ke components kya kya hai? Okay, now beta HCG, alpha fetoprotein definitely inhibin A is a marker, so inhibin B is out, right? So it should be inhibin B. But many students are saying that it was it was given as estradiol, not estriol. Remember, we use unconjugated estriol. 
as the marker, not estradiol, the, 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 the component of the estradiol. So if you think about it, this is between both. I would think this is probably a typo and I would go with this because the name of the test is actually dimeric inhibin A and it's not inhibin B. So most likely this would be the answer they'll be looking for. But yes, I understand your confusion because estradiol is not a marker. Estriol is. So again, um, I don't know why. I mean, I feel it's just a mistake from their end. Not uh, to, uh, so that becomes a bit unfortunate for those who have mask mark. I don't even know what the correct answer they've said they've thought of, but uh, I would mark uh, seeing the previous because this question has been repeated several times in INI itself in the last three years. This is the third time it's coming, and this was the answer. Okay, so next question mitochondria of spermatozoa. This is from anatomy, I guess you could put it there, but also from gynae. And we know that the mitochondria is in the neck in the connecting part. So this is the correct answer. In the in the so you have the spermatozoa here, you have the nucleus. Here you have in the connecting part, you have the mitochondria and then you have the remaining sperm. So the connecting part contains the mitochondria, which is not a germ cell tumor already discussed in pathology. Granulosa cell tumor is a sex called stromal tumor. All the rest are examples of germ cell tumor. Again, very straightforward question. Okay, so again, no, not much clinical questions came, which is uh, unusual. Yes, I know, but the questions that came are pretty straightforward. Physiological changes in pregnancy all occur except. So we do know there is fasting hypoglycemia and postprandial hyperglycemia. Remember, blood pressure falls. In the first trimester, also it falls. Maximum fall is in the second trimester. It doesn't increase. There is a fall. There is increase in RBC mass, which is not in proportion to the increase in blood volume, hence the physiological anemia. And there is increased peripheral insulin resistance. So there is a decrease in the blood pressure, not an increase in the blood pressure. Okay, inhibin A was given. So if inhibin A was given here, then the answer is estradiol. If there was estradiol, then the answer is inhibin B. So just remember the components. The components you should know are alpha fetoprotein, unconjugated estradiol, beta HCG, and inhibin, sorry, inhibin A. Okay, and where B is, wherever you have B, these are increased and these two are decreased in a mother whose baby has Down syndrome. Okay. Next question. Dr. Savita is posted in a low resource hospital cell setting. So this is a low resource setting. She explains the female about risk factors of cervical cancer. I think this was of cervical cancer, including HPV. Right. I think this was what was given which would be appropriate for cervical cancer screening. Now, remember, we know the best test, of course, is the HPV. Okay. But remember, this is a low resource setting. So the, 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 the WHO and the American Cancer Society guidelines clearly say HPV is the best test. But they also say that if not possible, then the preferred test is pap smear alone every three years because this is a place and low resources specifically mentioned for this reason. I've told in my classes also, the HPV is a very expensive test. It's yet not freely available for all and many patients will not be able to afford it. So pap smear is the best test. If you're doing a pap smear once every three years. Okay, and this was the last question. The, again, this was the only confusing question I found, which might have been confusing, but I need a bit more detail in this. What else was asked? A 24-year-old woman with abdominal pain with a 14-week mass, so a large abdominal mass corresponding to a 14-week size uterus. On ultrasound, there is an 8 by 5 centimeter ovarian mass. She's a known case of rheumatic heart disease on warfarin. I think some other risk factors also, I mean, other medical conditions were also mentioned okay what is the next best step okay so here she's come with pain remember i've told you this any cyst or any ovarian mass more than eight centimeter and even if not symptomatic she is symptomatic she's having pain you do surgical exploration whether you do laparoscopy or laparotomy is a different question but you will operate on her you will not leave her alone it's a huge mass uh, corresponding to a 14 week size mass Yes, CA-125 is also a good option. I know that. Okay, but it's unlikely in a young girl that's, that, that, that you would find a cyst adenocarcinoma, okay, where it is raised. 
but yes this is also i could understand the 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 the, the confusion here but anything even if the ca125 comes low it's not that you won't operate it won't change your management that's why surgical expression is the best answer okay and what surgical expression to do probably would depend on your ca125 levels but still the better option here would be a surgical expiration, probably a laparoscopy or laparotomy, and then do a cystectomy or a vedectomy, or maybe more depending on other risks. Okay. So uniloculated cyst was given. Okay. Still, it will not change. Of course, if multilocated, definitely do surgery. Unilocated would be more. Sim so even if you see the, the table in Novax, which I teach from, the table in Novax clearly says less than six, don't operate. 6 to 8 is the doubtful um, um, uh, time when you don't know what to do. Even if the C125 comes normal, you will still plan her for surgery. So that's what I'm trying to imply. Surgical exploration is the best. So that's what I got from OBS and Gaini. If there are any other questions, let me know. Okay. And um, um, uh, we can discuss this question further because I still need to get more input on this question. I know it's a little controversial. Music